as a member of the CAA and has worked in a number of different capacities from being a metallurgist all the way through to being a computer programmer writing software um, and has been hugely interested in science and astronomy in general for more like 50 years so um, I've got a huge breadth of knowledge I'm sure and chose this subject tonight of the Big Bang and Steady State Controversy, which has got a great Cambridge connection because of uh, the likes of uh, Herman Bondi and Fred Hoyle and other names that we might well hear about, all uh, being connected with the Institute of Astronomy in Cambridge. So uh, without further ado, I shall hand over to Jeff and uh, let him uh, entertain us for the next 45 minutes to an hour. Over to you, Jeff. Okay, thanks Paul. Before I start, I would like to thank you for uh, letting me talk. But uh, of course, that's tempered by the fact that the day that you uh, put out the announcement that I was talking, you also put out the announcement that Lord Rees was talking. So, no pressure there then. Right. Anyway, tonight I want to talk about uh, a controversy that started in uh, about 1948. Uh, a year after I was born, in fact, and ran for about 20 years. And you might wonder why I'm interested in something, why should you be interested in a controversy that's obsolete now? But when I first got really interested in science in the sort of late 50s, early 60s, I was quite surprised that uh, despite the fact that all the, all the mainstream uh, sciences, which you learned about at school, uh, were over a hundred years in terms of having a base theory that scientists were building on. And even, even modern physics, by which I mean relativity, quantum mechanics, atomic structure and all that stuff, even that had been around for the sort of working lifetime of a typical scientist. But cosmology didn't have a single foundation. It wasn't a, a, a science that was founded properly at all. But even more surprising was the way that this was being argued about. It was, it was quite a revealing argument. Um, so we'll get into uh, what happened here. Uh, in order to uh, appreciate it, we have to say that cosmology itself, uh, people must have been interested in the nature universe of the universe for well, thousands of years, I'm sure. But actually, until about 1912, astronomers really didn't have a picture of the universe that looked like the one we have today. I mean, it wasn't until uh, Slipher and Hubble uh, decided that the Milky Way wasn't the extent of the universe, that the, um, the things that, some of the things that they then called nebulae were actually uh, galaxies in their own right, island universes as I remember them being called, although that term has fortunately faded into uh, obscurity. And they also showed that these galaxies were receding at a rate that's proportional to their distance. Uh, the fact that they're directly proportional is quite important because it means if you look at the way things are, and then you look, try and look back in time. If something's twice as far away, it's receding twice as fast. So if you look back in time, it'll get to the same point that we are at the same time as everything else. So uh, the implication is that the universe is becoming a lot less dense, everything is moving away. So uh, the universe is being scattered. And if you try and look backwards, you uh, get back to a, a point in time where virtually the whole universe was in pretty much the same place. Uh, and uh, this, is some, this was sometimes called uh, the primeval atom. Uh, it was, uh, comes from Lemaitre, uh, uh, an astronomer who was also uh, a Catholic priest at the time. Um, uh, he did a lot of work on this, and the, this was the, the foundation of what's now called the Big Bang, although that term wasn't used then. 
but it's the idea that the universe started with this at this very dense point and exploded outwards from there. Now, in parallel with the astronomy that we normally think of, there was a lot of theory going on, uh, driven by uh, the publication of Einstein's general theory of relativity. You might be glad to know, I'm not gonna say very much about it tonight, but you can't really talk about 20th century cosmology and ignore relativity because it creeps into everything. The point of uh, the general theory is that it provides a set of equations which you can then solve to provide equations which might describe some fairly simple object like the gravity field around a planet or they can also be solved if you feed in the initial conditions, enough information, it can be solved to give you a, pic a mathematical picture of the universe. But one problem with, uh, with general relativity, it's not like special relativity where the maths is only slightly harder than the Newtonian maths that it replaces. Uh, general relativity is much more awkward. You can write the, the field equations in this uh, lovely simple looking form at the top, but that's actually deceptive. Uh, that is a set of 16 equations because these subscripts each take uh, a value of one to four, corresponding to the three spatial dimensions and one of time. So this is really 16 equations, and with a bit of jiggery pokery, it can show that actually you only need to solve 10 of them because the others are not independent. There are also uh, partial differential equations. If you're not a mathematician, uh, all you need to know about that is they're tough. This is, it's hard work. And when Einstein came up with these equations, uh, it, he wasn't even sure that they'd ever be solved to do anything particularly useful. And in fact, in order to get that far, he had struggled for years, including drafting in for several months the help of uh, David Hilbert, the pr most prominent mathematician of his time. Anyway, he eventually came up with these equations and they relate the curvature of space to the distribution of matter. And then you need to solve them to get anything useful. Surprisingly soon after uh, they were published, Schwarzschild produced a, a solution. Basically, if you think of just a, a, a sphere, a uniform sphere, which is not rotating, uh, Schwarzschild's solution shows the gravity field round that object. The object could be a golf ball, a planet, a black hole, whatever. Uh, that was uh, end of 1915, beginning of 1916, uh, so still in First World War. Uh, Friedman produced uh, a solution which attempted to describe the whole universe. Then Lemaitre, who we've already talked about a little, he was the, the Belgian priest come mathematician and astronomer, uh, tied the observation of the expanding universe from the, the Hubble law, which actually nowadays is more correctly called the Hubble Lemaitre law, in with uh, relativity and produced uh, a solution and a description that uh, the, I think that, that that was correct. Those ideas were driven a lot further later on by uh, the, uh, the nuclear physicist George Gamo, who worked in, uh, in the States. In 1948, uh, he had a, a group that were working on this sort of thing. And Gamo and his student, Ralph Alpha, uh, wrote uh, what has become known as the Alpha Beta Gamma uh, paper. It's called that because Gamma was a right joker. He took, you know, he, he wrote very serious and very advanced uh, science papers, which he got published in very prestigious journals, uh, notably the Physical Review, the premier 
premier journal of its time. And, uh, but he liked to work jokes in, and it seemed to him a shame to have Alpha and Gamma without a beta. But his mate, Hans Beta, was actually on holiday. He wasn't around at the time. So <laughs> without actually speaking to him, uh, Gamma submitted the paper as being by Alpha, Beta and Gamma. <laughs> it's actually quite an important paper. It's much cited uh, and it's always called the Alpha, Beta, Gamma paper. Um, Gamma's sense of humor will come back in later. Um, essentially, this paper built on the ideas that Lemaitre had had and showed how you can build up elements from uh, what was presumed to be a gas of neutrons, uh, which came from the, uh, the remains of, the, of Lemaitre's primeval atom. And neutrons, because at that time, uh, there was no such thing as quark theory, so neutrons were considered to be the simplest elementary particle. And also, there are other technical reasons. You can build everything from neutrons. Um, and it, it correctly gave the relative abundances of the light and elements. Basically, Gamow's group uh, set, took the, the, the basis of the Big Bang Theory about as far as it could be at that time. Um, there was also, uh, they had a colleague, uh, Herman, or Robert Herman, and Herman uh, used the extent of the theory of infer. He managed to estimate the size of galaxies and all sorts of things. And as will be uh, seen later, Herman and Alpha uh, also predicted that the Big Bang would have produced a massive amount of black body radiation. Black body radiation is just the radiation given off by something that's hot. And in this context, hot means anything above zero Kelvin, right? Um, right. And uh, they said, well, you know, there will have been this uh, black body radiation, which would have had a characteristic temperature, which would be enormous. But the expansion of the universe would have ex expanded the wavelength and you'd end up with a characteristic temperature, which they couldn't calculate accurately, but they said, well, it's going to be around five degrees. It's also worth noting that Gamma spent quite a bit of time unsuccessfully trying to persuade Herman to change his name to Delta, but, <laughs> but he wasn't successful. And also, uh, Beta uh, did say that if, uh, if he had any more queries to answer about the Alpha, Beta, Gamma paper, he was going to change his name to Zacharias. But despite all the jokes, Gamma was a top physicist of his day, and this was the top work on, on the theory. It was very serious. But then something quite astonishing happened. A whole new way of looking at the universe came into, uh, into, uh, into existence because of three friends. Uh, Hoyle on the left, this picture is actually taken not long after this, uh, after this work. This is with, he was just a few years older th than he was at this time. And uh, Tommy Gould, Thomas Gould uh, and uh, Herman Bondy, all at Cambridge, all, so, uh, well, all junior, relatively junior academics. Um, Hoyle was the most senior of the three. And uh, all of them, they were all brilliant men in their own way. They were quite different characters, uh, but they were all quite brilliant. Anyway, uh, what they had uh, a friendship that involved evenings where they would get together and pick uh, a scientific topic and discuss it to death. And when I say discuss it to death, I mean, they really went to town. This was a little bit like the Olympian Academy that Einstein had with his friends when he was uh, setting out. They, they, uh, they really worked everything out. I mean, Hoyle was quite a mathematician in his own right, and Bondi was actually a brilliant mathematician. Um, but anyway, they went to see this picture, which was 
advertised, uh, was promoted at the time using this really wonderful piece of fine art that you see on the right. Uh, this was uh, The Dead of Night. It actually uh, wasn't, uh, I mean, it had a cast that was quite impressive. It had Michael Redgrave, Boogie Withers in it. In those days, horror films weren't necessarily trash. They did make some effort at having some thoughtful content. And this, in this one, uh, the idea was that you could get stuck in a permanent nightmare. The film is actually five different stories, different actors, different directors, but they start uh, with a man uh, walking up uh, to a lonely house. And then it goes on and on through uh, all the other stories, which end up with the same man uh, walking up the lane uh, to a lonely house. The implication, what you were supposed to think of was that these guys were stuck in a permanent nightmare that would never change. They would be stuck in it forever. After the film, uh, Gold uh, said, well, what if the universe is like that? What if the universe isn't expanding from uh, into empty space and getting less dense? What if it's permanently renewing itself so that Everything is moving and changing locally, but if you take a sufficiently large scale, both in terms of time and space, it's going to be static. It's going to be the same. Static isn't quite the right word, but unchanging in a statistical sense. His friends took this as a challenge. They, they decided this is a silly idea, but it'll be fun to debate it seriously and to disprove it. But after a while, they decided it really wasn't a silly idea. It was actually, you couldn't disprove it. There was nothing that was known that showed that it was wrong. Uh, it, there was no observation that showed it was wrong. There was no theory that showed it was wrong. It was, it was entirely plausible. I should, in the interests of accuracy, point out that the exact importance of the film uh, has been called into question, but I, the way I'm telling the story is the way uh, Hoyle tells it, so I'm not without some justification for putting the film in. Now, the idea of the um, of this universe is that it 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 doesn't change. So if you uh, if you look at it, it's a bit like looking at this uh, this video. If you look at this video. Uh, and you look at it, you take a, a picture of it one second and then a picture of it two seconds later, nothing's the same, everything's moved. Uh, all, the, all the stars or galaxies or whatever, dots on the screen, they've all moved about. But if you come back a quarter of an hour later and look at it, you won't be able to tell a quarter of an hour has passed. At a statistical level, everything stays exactly the same. And that is actually the point of this, um, the, the, the point of this uh, theory is that nothing changes, right? Everything remains the same. So in 1948, uh, they wrote two different papers. Uh, there was a certain amount of friendly rivalry and Bondi and Gold uh, came out, their paper came out first but only by a couple of weeks. Their paper was a very philosophical sort of paper. They described the theory, they described the ideas that I've just given, um, and they gave sort of philosophical reasoning. They said, well, uh, Mach's principle implies that uh, if, if the universe was changing in density, that then the physical laws, or at least the constants that govern the physical laws, would also change. Uh, Mach's principle comes from the idea that there's no uh, absolute frame of reference in terms of linear momentum. If I'm traveling at 100 miles an hour in a steady speed at one in one direction and you're going 100 miles in, the, in a different direction, there's nothing to say that my uh, frame of reference is any more important than yours. All inertial frames of reference are the same, but that's not true 
when you consider rotation. Think about this. If you take a bucket and fill it with water and hang it up and then spin it, so it's spinning around the axis of the, of the bucket, when the water is built up the same speed as the bucket itself, it'll start to move out from the center and up the walls of the bucket. And if you stop the bucket, the water will settle back in the middle. That implies that somehow the bucket does know when it's at rest, at least rotationally, not in terms of linear momentum, but in terms of rotation, there is such a thing as an absolute rest in terms of rotation. And Mach implied, this is Mach of um, the, the physicist who talked about Mach speeds and so on. Mach said that means that it's actually the mass in the whole universe somehow determines the property of, uh, of space. And therefore, according to Bondi and Gould, if this mass was all flying apart, the properties of space would change and you could probably detect it. It has to be said that although Mach's principle has been a bit of an inspiration, notably to Einstein, who put a lot of effort into it, it's not really an established law of physics. Uh, it's an idea. They also invented something called the perfect cosmological principle. Now, that really refers to the idea that there is no special point in space. This comes from the Copernican revolution when uh, astronomers said, no, the uh, Earth isn't the, the center of the, uh, of the universe. And then later on, they said, no, the sun isn't the center of the universe. In fact, everywhere, everywhere in the universe is equivalent. You could pick any star and call it the center, and that would be equally valid. That uh, is what they refer to as the cosmological principle. But Bondi and Gould wanted to take it a step further. They said there's a perfect cosmological principle, which means not only is there no special point in space, there's no special point in time either. Everywhere, every time is the same, in the same sense that every point is the same. Rather, Surprisingly, especially in view of, of Bondi's later career, they didn't uh, bring general relativity into their paper at all. In fact, they, at that time, they didn't really think that applying uh, general relativity theory to studies of the universe as a whole was a particularly good idea. Uh, Hoyle produced his paper, um, which was quite different. Hoyle's paper was full of maths. It was, uh, it, it, it tried to extend uh, Einstein's field equations by adding in a creation tensor, which accounted for the creation of new matter. In some ways, uh, this is a little bit analogous, as long as you don't push the analogy too far, to the idea of uh, dark energy. No, it, it's a similar sort of idea. The space itself has this property which gives it the energy to create new matter. It's also important to notice that Hoyle was uh, quite strong on the idea that he didn't like the idea of the creation of the universe at some moment, at any one instant. For him, that was just uh, just horrible. He didn't like the idea at all. One obvious objection to, uh, to the theory is, well, if there's all this matter springing into appearance all over the place, why, can't, why don't we ever see it? Well, Heil uh, did the calculation and showed that you would get somewhere between one and three hydrogen atoms per cubic meter per million years. So if you built a detector the size of the Albert Hall that was capable of detecting the production of an atom within it, you'd have to hang around for about 100,000 years probably before you noticed anything. So there's no real observational problem here. Um, the the uh, matter he thought would come in as neutrons. But one 
difficulty if you're trying to debate uh, the Big Bang against the steady state theory is that there wasn't really much evidence. If we look at the Big Bang first, the people who uh, supported it said, look, it's a simple theory. You don't have to add in all this creation of matter nonsense. It's much simpler. It, it just sort of follows automatically from the expansion of the universe. Against that, however, Hoyle's argument is yes, but the Big Bang, it's only simple because you're ignoring the Big Bang. Surely the creation of an entire uh, universe in one instant isn't really that simple. It's a, it's a piece of magic that's going to be forever beyond science. You have to be a little bit careful how you argue about the creation of the universe, of course, because there is no moment before the Big Bang in, in conventional theory, because time and space were created at the Big Bang. But as I pointed out, there's still a time zero, and in time zero there's a universe, and there's no time before that. So, you know, where did the universe come from? If you object to the conservation of mass and energy, how come you're happy your universe is springing out of nowhere? The only piece of real scientific evidence uh, to, uh, to come out of all this was the age of the universe problem. If you looked at Hubble's laws and worked out when the Big Bang had occurred, using the data that they had then, you end up with the universe was about 1.8 billion years old. But geologists knew full well that the Earth was at least four and a half billion years old. They could tell that from uh, radioactive aging, the ratios of various radioactive isotopes. And also it takes more than two billion years for some of the geological processes to have shaped the Earth. So that, that was kind of a problem with the Big Bang. The steady state was really no better. Uh, Bondi and uh, Gold had argued about the, the perfect cosmological principle and Marx principle, but really they're just assertions. They're not well-established scientific laws. You can say, well, they're true and maybe they are, but saying they're true doesn't really prove anything. The one thing they could say is that the, the age of the universe uh, problem disappears, of course, and the steady state theory, bits of the universe could be any age, bits of it can be new, bits of it are ancient, the universe is eternal. The counter to that argument, the Big Bang Theory would say, yeah, but hang on, let's not throw our whole picture of the universe out the window for such uh, uh, for such a, a flimsy piece of evidence, they suspected correctly, as we now know, that the real explanation was just that the, uh, the, the distance scale that was being used at the time had never been calibrated properly. That it, it was indeed true that the, the galaxies that were thought to be remote were further away than the galaxies that were thought to be near but the actual, when you actually came to put numbers on it, you want to calibrate the scale, uh, that wasn't correct. And a lot of astronomers were pretty sure that was the case anyway. The whole thing was uh, complicated a little bit by having religion dragged into it. Um, Hoyle was uh, not religious, um, especially he was anti-clerical uh, and in, in his popular books and his radio talks, you've got to remember that Hoyle was somewhat like a radio version of Patrick Moore later. He gave very popular talks on the radio. He was actually quite well known. And in his books and his talks, he was quite dismissive of religion, which did uh, annoy several uh, bishops. On the other side, uh, some of the big bank supporters, including Milne, who was... Uh, probably one of the more important uh, astronomers at the time, uh, definitely associated the creation that happened at the Big Bang with their uh, belief in God. Um, 
despite that, all <laughs> the learned journals, the scientific journals, didn't publish uh, uh, religious arguments, of course. They stuck to proper scientific arguments, with the notable exception, again, of Gamo. He uh, had an article in Physical Review in which he uh, included a long quote from the current, uh, from what was then the current Pope, who was actually a very well-informed uh, Pope. He knew a lot about science and was very interested in it, but to the somewhat to the embarrassment of his, the uh, Vatican astronomers, he associated the Big Bang with the biblical creation story. And Gamow actually managed to put a long uh, quote from uh, uh, the Pope at the beginning as a prelude to one of his articles in Physical Review. It should be noted though, Gamow <laughs> was actually an atheist. Uh, there's no doubt this was just a jape on his part. Uh, Hoyle on the other hand, uh, although he was uh, against re uh, religion and, and uh, priests and so on in, in general, he wasn't, he didn't carry it out to his ridiculous level. He uh, came back on a, he gave a, a car ride uh, back from Sorrento in South Italy to uh, Lemaitre, who, like I've said before, was a Catholic priest and who was, had a totally different view on life, on religion, and certainly on cosmology. Uh, and the biggest problem they had was, uh, while Hoyle always wanted to argue about science, Lemaitre was rather fond of generous lunches with glasses of red wine, and he just wanted to go to sleep in the afternoon while Hoyle drove them back. But perhaps more than the um, religious question, there was a whole issue about whether cosmology really was a science. Um, this came to a head really at a, a meeting when Herbert Dingle, who was the president of the Royal Astronomical Society, uh, gave a really hostile attack on theoretical physicists in general, and he, but he really picked on Hoyle, Gold, and Bondi. He described the theory as an outrage to science and ridiculous quackery. He had a point in that the theory was highly speculative, and Bo uh, Hoyle in particular was prone to pass it off as an established scientific theory, which it really wasn't. But what was surprising was that he really exaggerated and distorted the arguments and set up all sorts of straw men, which he then knocked down. You might think this is the sort of argument you might have in a pub, but this was an address to the Royal Astronomical Society by a man who held a chair in the history and philosophy of science. It was quite extraordinary. Um, at least, I suppose, in those days, they, they didn't have the internet and Twitter and so on, so they didn't get uh, this kind of vitriolic personal attacks that, um, for example, uh, came in in the, in the string wars when uh, the string wars are the, the arguments that came when people like, uh, well, particularly Peter White, but also uh, Roger Penrose, started to point out that the string theory had by then been around 20 years, clearly wasn't, uh, clearly in their opinion, wasn't going anywhere. There was no chance of the theory being completed and there was no chance uh, that it would ever make any connection with observation. That turned really nasty. And I think that the arguments around, um, around the, the Big Bang and steady state theory are very reminiscent of that. Uh, but not quite so vicious because there was no internet in those days. Anyway, Hoyle and, them, uh, Hoyle and his friends didn't even bother replying. They just regarded uh, Dingle as being just too absurd to even bother with. But scientists at the time didn't even think that uh, cosmology was a science, or at least not a proper science. There was no evidence. They didn't have the means to gather evidence. There was no basic theory. That it was debated in radio talks and books, which were often not really written to a high intellectual standard. The arguments were often uh, aesthetic. I don't like the idea of a big bang, or I don't like the idea that the universe has been there forever, and so on. 
But this is a time uh, after the Second World War when all sorts of advances in technology were moving really fast. All the guys who'd worked on, a lot of the guys anyway, had worked on radar in the Second World War were now working on electronics and um, radio uh, telescopes, radio astronomy, and satellites were being launched or, or being developed. So things were moving forward. And the steady state theory did actually make definite predictions. And so sooner or later, the evidence did start to emerge. Uh, Ryle, uh, this is Martin Ryle, who was later an astronomer Royal, and who worked at Cambridge, but in a totally different group uh, from Hoyle, a different group organizationally and certainly socially. Uh, he uh, had a, a radio telescope and he produced in 1955, the second Cambridge survey which showed a distribu the distribution of radio uh, sources in the sky. Now, the results are shown in this graph on the right. Now, if you don't like maths, I'm just gonna have to ask you to take my word for it, that the steady state theory says that, well, uh, if radio sources have been produced equally throughout all time and space, which is definitely implied by the steady state theory, uh, then if you draw a graph of the logarithm of the number of these things against the logarithm of the intensity, which here is a proxy for their distance, the further away they are, the fainter they are, they should lie on this straight line. If you do like maths, it's, I think it's fascinating to point out that the slope of that straight line is surprisingly simple. Because if you have a sphere based on the Earth, its volume, and therefore the number of radio sources it's going to contain, is directly proportional to the cube of its radius. But the average distance of these sources uh, is proportional to the, the radius, and therefore the intensity is, propor is inversely proportional to the square. So the slope of this line is in fact three over two. If that sounds gobbledygook, just take it from me. The steady state theory says this point should lie on this line. It's perfectly leg legitimate to ignore the points at the top because they are the points where the intensity is very low. They are right at the limit of what uh, Ryle's telescope could detect. So some sources are gonna be lost, and so you're gonna get some spurious ones due to noise in the equipment. So it's perfectly reasonable to ignore those. The scatter at the bottom is also not surprising. We are using in the intensity of the signal as a proxy for distance. But of course, the sources don't all have the same absolute strength. So some of them are gonna be stronger than others just because they are intrinsically stronger. Ryle claimed that this graph showed conclusively that the steady state theory was wrong because the points don't lie on this, on this curve, on this slope. Uh, um, Hoyle and his friends were skeptical and they had, they had good reason to be. For one thing, the tele this was a very early radio telescope and its spatial resolution was actually quite poor. So instead of each uh, source being seen as a point, it covered a, a, a small area in the sky, which meant some of them overlapped. So some of these sources could in fact be multiple sources that just happened to lie within the same blodge of sky that the, um, that the, the, the receiver detected. Uh, he was also doubtful about the accuracy of the electronics, but he couldn't really argue with Ryle about that because Ryle knew far more about that than he did. So they were skeptical of the observations and Ryle's group were equally skeptical about the speculative nature of the theorists. Uh, and he had some reason, uh, like, I say, like I said before, Ryle tended to present the Big Bang theory as, as a as if it was proved, whereas in fact it really was quite speculative. 
So Hoyle did manage to show that Hoyle's 1955 results weren't definitive. Uh, and this was helped by the fact that some result, early results from uh, Australia didn't, didn't support Royal. But radio astronomy was advancing enormously fast. And by 1961, results from both Cambridge and Caltech showed that really this slope was about one, minus 1.8, not 1.5. And it was outside the, the possible range of error. You couldn't actually, the arguments that, Royal, that Hoyle had used to discredit the original results really didn't apply. There was no doubt. Uh, unfortunately for Hoyle, he attended a, a meeting at the Royal Astronomical Society when these results were announced. And there were newspapers on, on sale outside saying the Bible was right, that the earth was created. As time went by, more and more radio evidence, uh, radio uh, astronomy evidence came in and it just got stronger and stronger. The steady state theory was clearly in serious trouble. Hoyle managed to come back a little bit uh, with the publication of the B squared FH paper. This is a paper by mainly by uh, Willie Fowler and Fred Hoyle, but also with the help of uh, um, Jeffrey and Margaret Burbage. This showed that um, heavier elements can be built in stars. This this might sound irrelevant, but it was actually part of the debate. In, as part of the Big Bang Theory, the idea was that all the elements, all the, all the heavy elements that we see now, came from the Big Bang. And that is actually quite problematic. Because the Big Bang happened so quickly, the necessary processes by which these bigger nuclei could build up didn't have time to happen. And the fact that Hoyle could show that they are actually these elements were built up in stars it was quite a, a boost. It was a boost to his credibility and it did uh, indirectly really give a boost to the steady state theory. Although of course it didn't disprove the Big Bang Theory at all. But things from Hoyle's perspective really went from bad to worse. In 1958, Highland Gold had produced a mathematical model of the uh, universe in which uh, there was a hot interstellar medium, uh, which was related to the way matter was created. And in 1962, satellite observations detected diffuse uh, background X-rays. You need satellites because uh, this graph shows how much of uh, radiation at each wavelength is absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere. And x-rays are over here, so 100% of x-rays are absorbed. Uh, visible lights here, uh, a lot of infrared is here, uh, some infrared radio uh, wavelengths come through, a lot don't, and radio waves are down here. So you need a satellite to do this. In 1962, uh, background uh, x-rays were detected. Hoyle said, oh, this, this is Bremsstrahlung radiation. That's uh, the radiation that comes when uh, highly energetic electrons are suddenly decelerated. And uh, his theory of a hot interstellar medium did predict such a, a thing. But Burbage, who was actually a friend of Hoyle's and was a steady state theory supporter, showed uh, did far more sophisticated calculations than Hoyle and showed that actually uh, the, um, the Hoyle gold model predicted far more radiation and at totally the wrong temperature. The hot steady state model was ruled out, really. It was absolutely eliminated by this work. Uh, and that did damage Hoyle's defense of the steady state theory. But the core ideas of uh, the steady state model weren't actually uh, written off. Uh, right, I, I shall speed up a bit now. Uh, in uh, the 60s, uh, quasars were being studied, very bright sources of radio waves. They all have very high redshifts. So if you take the normal um, astronomical conventions, that means 
you think this is because they are a long way away and they're therefore receding, therefore they are all old. The steady state theory says, well, you know, they should get new ones as well, which would be much closer. Hoyle tried to argue that the redshifts weren't cosmological, but a lot of people weren't convinced, including uh, Dennis Siama, who'd been one of, uh, who'd been a collaborator on the steady state theory. Final nail uh, in the coffin came uh, in 1965. Penzias and Wilson uh, very famously got their, this huge horn antenna and detected uh, a background, uh, cosmic microwave background radiation. And uh, they didn't know what it was. They just said, yeah, look, there's this signal and it comes from space. But Robert Dick's group at Princeton, uh, who were about to actually start searching for the cosmic uh, microwave background, they knew what it was. They recognized it and uh, said, this is the radiation predicted by Herman and Alpha years ago. The detection of the cosmic microwave background is important because it really settled the question, is cosmology a science? If you were of the opinion that it really wasn't, if you had been of the opinion, you might have to revise it now because now uh, theory and observation are being linked. Uh, cosmology really is a science now. Penzias and Wilson got the Nobel Prize. Dick and his work has got quite a lot of credit. Alfred and Herman, <laughs> who predicted the radiation in the first place, got pretty much forgotten. Although much later, they did actually get some credit. And for those of you who are bursting to ask but are too polite to interrupt, uh, Robert Dick, who did this, uh, is in fact the same uh, Robert Dick who gives his name to the Brands Dick theory of relativity. Anyway, uh, the discovery of the cosmic microwave background really did kill off the steady state theory for most astronomers. This is really the end of the story. Um, the, uh, the Big Bang theory predicted the, the, the cosmic microwave background. The steady state theory didn't. Now you can, in, you have to invent mechanisms in the steady state theory, and it's very hard to invent a theory that actually fits. Partly because it's a general radiation, you can think, you know, it, it's everywhere, and partly because it's uniform. Most of us are familiar with this map of the uh, cosmic microwave background, which actually does show all these little variations. But the characteristic temperature is 2.725 plus or minus four thousandths of a degree Kelvin. That's pretty uniform. In this, if, if you invent a mechanism in the steady state, you end up saying, well, these clumps of gas that appeared at different times and different parts of the uh, space have exactly the same temperature. That's a bit of a struggle. And in fact, uh, really, the cosmic microwave. wave, I mean, the theory, the steady state theory was already falling out of popularity, but that really finished it off. Um, the majority of people uh, simply uh, forgot about it. Uh, like I say, Siama changed his stance, Bondi and Gold uh, gave up on cosmology altogether. Um, they did go on to have quite distinguished careers. Uh, Gold uh, got involved in several quite interesting controversies after this, including a big row with NASA. Um, but nevertheless, he was a very accomplished scientist. And Bondi became uh, a, a, a relativity specialist. As I mentioned before, he had a phenomenal mathematical uh, talent. And one of the things he did was to show that the Einstein field equations mean that if you have two massive bodies in a close orbit, rapidly orbiting each other, they're gonna give off uh, gravity waves. They're gonna lose energy in the form of gravity waves. Now, when, when Bondi predicted this, it was, 
of no real interest to anybody. There was no vague possibility of discovering it, of measuring it. But much later, uh, it gave a lot of encouragement to people to look for uh, gravity waves. And, you know, without the proof that they existed, people may never have built the gravity wave detectors that have now opened up a new chapter in astronomy. Hoyle himself didn't give up. He kept inventing various variants on his steady state theory. They were intended to, um, intended to, to link the actual observations to the steady state theory, but they were complicated and unnatural and actually they didn't work particularly well either. So although Hoyle stuck at it, very few people stuck with him. That's pretty much the end of the story, except to say that people still speculate about these things. People still speculate about um, uh, the Big Bang and was there any time before it? And a good example is uh, Penrose, who won the, won the half of the Nobel Prize for Physics this year. And he put out a book uh, in 1916, uh, sorry, 2016, uh, called Cycles of Time. Now, Penrose is an interesting chap. He, he has a fairly whimsical side where he puts out purely speculative stuff, but it's incredibly well argued. It's argued very thoroughly, but he doesn't pretend that this is a, a proper, well-established scientific theory. And he, uh, he has a lot of thermodynamic uh, ideas in here. Uh, and he uh, says that eventually the universe will decay, all the black holes will evaporate. Uh, uh, the only form of mass uh, will be, the only form of energy will be massless particles like photons. And time and space don't mean much to photons because they can zap across, you know, according to their own uh, clocks, uh, their time doesn't exist. So a universe full of particles zapping about without time or distance is pretty much the same as the Big Bang. <laughs> like I say, it's a speculative idea. It's not an established theory. Penrose doesn't try and pretend that it is. I'd also like to say, if you ever struggled with the ideas of thermodynamics in general, <laughs> and entropy in particular, there's an excellent explanation of it in this book. And that's it.